As the Earth spins in the vast universe, it carries with it the weight of human progress and the scars of our achievements. Each year, we emit over 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide, pushing our planet ever closer to a climate precipitous. But in this moment of urgency, innovation offers a beacon of hope. In this episode, we traverse the globe from the sun-drenched expanses of the Red Sea to the bustling streets of urban centers, exploring how cutting-edge initiatives are redefining what it means to live sustainably. Hi, I'm Ian Khan, and I'm the host of The Futurist. In this episode, we delve into the controversies and triumphs of sustainability efforts, from the corporate giants betting big on green technology to small communities forging paths to independence through circular economies. We confront the stark inequalities in climate action questioning whether the burdens and benefits are fairly shared across the globe. How do we balance surveillance with privacy and who gets to control the narrative of global warming? There are many ways that we can uh, slice and dice sustainability all over the world. But I think we should all come together in agreeing that sustainability is really about caring for the planet and the people. And the and is important. It is not people at the expense of the planet and it's not planet at the expense of people. Carbon is the next frontier. We're all made of carbon. Carbon is everywhere. Carbon is part of the equation. But unfortunately, over the past decades, we have been too uh, resource demanding, resource greedy, and we have been emitting too much. Global warming is upon us. 2023, unfortunately, has crossed that global warming threshold of 1.5 degrees. As the clock ticks towards 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals chart a course for a more equitable sustainable world. But how realistic are these targets and what progress have we made? This section provides a critical examination of these global ambitions, revealing the successes and the gaps in our collective pursuit of countries now integrating environmental data into their decision-making processes. We are at a turning point. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are essentially an evolution, an updating of the Millennium Goals that we used to have. And the Sustainable Development Goals are goals that are being globally set by essentially all governments around the world, meant to be achieved by 2030. In my view, the Sustainable Development Goals are a vision, a roadmap, uh, an aspiration, if you like, about how would a thriving society look like? What do we need to do to arrive at a thriving society? And it's a very comprehensive set of goals. As global CO2 emissions from transport make up nearly a quarter of all emissions, initiatives like these are not just necessary, they are vital for our survival. Let's continue our exploration by examining how the tech industry is tackling its part in the sustainability challenge. We are failing to curb emissions because we don't know exactly who is emitting and we are not able to create the right policies and regulation to stop emissions. And we are not able to do that because of lack of data. So data is absolutely at the heart, at the beginning of uh, any uh, powerful climate action. There is no way we can transform of our energy system if we don't know who is, is emitting what and when. So that's really the, the, the hard beginning of any uh, action that uh, we have to, uh, to do in order to curb emissions. To do that, um, satellite is essential because uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from everywhere. As electronic waste grows year on year, the need for responsible production and disposal practices becomes urgent. Up next, 
we look deeper into how tech companies are navigating these waters, implementing innovative strategies to minimize their environmental footprint. Right now, I'm seeing transportation industry moving super fast. I'm, I'm seeing consumer industry, luxury industry moving as well because the consumer has, are asking for it. I'm seeing the pharmaceutical industry becoming conscious of that issue and in particular working on how to do sustainable manufacturing in the manufacturing plant. I'm seeing still a lot of challenge in the construction industry, but also in the infrastructure industry, logistics, and some cities. And it takes time. Unfortunately, this is where we have the biggest emissions. It's about explaining to the industries how they can use Virtual Twin, for example, to do eco-design, sustainable manufacturing, sustainable value chain, because with a virtual twin on the 3D experience platform, you can see, thanks to a sustainable innovation technology that we call as well EcoBill, how much is going to cost in terms of CO2, waste, but also power need in order to manufacture the product. And you can use artificial intelligence in order to optimize everything for sustainability. Climate change is an urgent issue. What is at stake is that we want to give back to our children a planet where it will be nice for them to live. Sustainability is the big priority. You know, is in the mind of everyone. But when you look at technology, I think we need to think of of sustainability in, in, in some buckets. So the first thing is the hardware producers and the manufacturers. And their priority is to find ways to produce uh, equipment that lasts long, uh, that they have a supply chain that is ethical, they use maybe some used material. Then you have the service providers like data centers. And their priority is how to reduce the energy consumption in the data centers. Then you have companies like ours, and we are a services company, so our priority is how do we manage these uh, technology assets during the primary lifetime, and how do we help company renew this equipment, and how we give this equipment a second life. Uh, it is a bit of an elephant in the room, so how, how are you going to eat this one? So you have to start eating it piece by piece. So I think a lot of companies, the intellectually and, um, and, and value-based, they want to implement the sustainability strategy. They're just lost uh, in this broader topic, you know, so I think some standards are needed. Of course, in terms of innovation, technology can uh, participate and can enable solutions that speak to climate change, you know. But when we speak about sustainability and technology, it's one thing when you participate to innovation and AI to net zero, and it is a different thing when you have to think of your e own impact, the impact on technology, on the environment. Mangroves, nature's own carbon scrubbers, outperform even the vast rainforests in their ability to sequester carbon. Today in the heart of the Red Sea, over a million mangrove seeds have been planted, each one a growing warrior against climate change. And so, Carbon is a, a very important dimension of what we do at Red Sea Global. For starters, we are off-grid, so we cannot just import electricity, which can be carbon intensive. We need to produce our own electricity, and we do, we do so from sunlight. So sunlight is literally powering our destination. So we have multiple solar farms uh, across the destinations in the Red Sea project and in Amala, and those will only increase over time. So currently we have 400 megawatt installed. So all that renewable energy is avoiding emissions. Every kilowatt hour counts. We have to use as little as possible to deliver the service that is needed. And then after that, that is called energy efficiency. And the last piece of the puzzle is well, can we perhaps enhance the sink? Can we mimic nature? Can we nudge nature to be a larger carbon sink? Focusing on the mangroves, mangroves globally are known to be very important carbon sinks, 
more significant than rainforests because all that carbon is down in the mud, in the sediments, and also in the trunks and in the canopy above the water line. And so uh, working with the National Center for the Vegetation Cover, uh, we have already planted more than a million. Those seeds are collected locally so that we protect the genetic diversity of the Red Sea. And then we find the suitable receptor sites through spatial planning, through GIS, so that over time we can enhance those carbon sinks. And this is how we're able to understand carbon flows in our destinations. Uh, from the carbon that was avoided to energy efficiency in the assets to enhancing the carbon sinks. We have just completed our carbon accounting framework which uh, identifies the boundaries of that ac accounting uh, uh, framework itself and so that is the standard by which we will measure the footprint and determine how we will offset it and how can we reduce it. The future glides over the water and soars through the skies with minimal impact on our planet. From foiling vessels to hydrogen-powered marine vehicles, the quest for net zero travel is becoming a reality. What challenges lie ahead in making sustainable aviation fuel the norm? And how close are we to a fleet of zero emission seaplanes? This segment explores the cutting edge of clean mobility navigating through the innovations that promise to redefine how we explore our world. So as part of Vision 2030's drive towards sustainable tourism especially, mobility for us follows the same objectives. Our commitment is around regenerative tourism. Our commitments around mobility are at net zero for land, sea and air, which has meant over the last few years we have developed a, a number of offerings to make that journey for our guests in and around the resort uh, comfortable, luxurious, safe and of course uh, with zero carbon emissions. We finally set up the largest single point charging infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, around 160 chargers. Um, as we move forward into our phase one and, and later phases, Next year, that goes up by 10, you know, 1,500 chargers uh, for the Red Sea and for Amala. Um, EV cars for our guests, again, fully sustainable, luxurious, um, powered by our grid, um, which is 760,000 solar panels dotted around the destination, um, making us completely off-grid. Our buses are the same. Uh, we have a foiling vessel. Uh, that uh, we are testing, um, it's a lot of fun, it's flying on the water pretty much, that uh, aims to be part of a future fleet of net zero uh, marine elements. Same with hydrogen that we're working on on the marine side. Uh, our seaplanes uh, today are conventionally powered, uh, but sustainable aviation fuel uh, is on its way very, very shortly, um, plus biofuel for, for some of our heavier trucks, uh, especially within logistics and supply chain. But what's coming is, is also fundamentally kind of important for us in, in terms of where, where mobility goes, how we develop our future offerings, give our guests the options of, you know, having this amazing super VIP experience in total luxury, and at the same time having a more cost-effective option. If you are looking at regenerative tourism, and at the least sustainable tourism, mobility and clean mobility has to be a part of that. So I do believe as technology advances, hopefully pricing will come down, everything becomes more competitive, it's more affordable to the, to the general public. And again, infrastructure and, and ways of harnessing sustainable power are going to be key for, for both tourism and, and mobility to enable that. And governments also need to find a way to leave behind the traditional fossil fuel uh, power generation methods and, and move into something that's more sustainable. A vision of an oil-free economy emerges from the sands of Saudi Arabia, leveraging the spectacular beauties of the Red Sea and ingenuity of its people. 
As the global economy pivots from industrial to service-based models, we explore how one nation is synchronizing its efforts with the planet's health. In a small town along the Red Sea, a remarkable transformation is underway, operating entirely on renewable energy, achieving net zero today, not decades from now. This isn't just planning for the future, it's living it. Ultimately, what we're trying to achieve is build a new economy. So leveraging the wonders and the beauty of the Red Sea, and if you, you have to see it with your own eyes to believe it, like our slogan is seen is believe it. Leveraging the Saudi talent, leveraging the Saudi hospitality to build this new service-based economy. So if you look at economies, North America, Europe, they're all shifting from industrial to service-based economies and we're following that trend. Countries commit 20, 40, 50, 60, 100. Believe it or not, we have a small town. It would classify as a small city, actually. The Turtle Bay Village today is operating on 100% renewable energy and it is essentially net zero. So Saudi, of all countries in the world, is the country that's actually delivering this and achieving this today. Not 2030, not 2040, not 2050, today. The only place in the world where you can have a, uh, a zero carbon vacation is the Red Sea destination. So if you care about the environment, that's the place to go. And when you come and visit our airport, you would not recognize it. It starts from the second you come. So when you land in our airport, it doesn't look like one. It's essentially our welcome center and it's designed to hit your five senses within your first five minutes of arrival. So there's gonna be a Red Sea scent and there's gonna be Red Sea music locally produced. You're gonna be handed you know, a fresh towel, a nice drink, and the visual impact because that place is stunning to see. So all five senses get hit. And then we put you on a ride to your destination. Efficiency is key in transforming tourism into a sustainable practice. At the Red Sea, every detail from transportation to logistics is meticulously managed through advanced technology, ensuring that sustainability is not a choice, but a given. As we delve into the operational side of this sustainable paradise, consider the role of technology in creating a seamless, eco-friendly tourist experience that does not compromise on quality or convenience. Ultimately, this has to be economical. It's, you could have a car per guest, but that's not economic. So it's all about the efficient management of our fleet, and we're using an application to do that management. So it picks the right locations for the cars, assigns jobs to drivers, and so on and so forth, kind of like Uber, but there's a catch. Our fleet is EV, so there's one more element, which is scheduling the charges right? Because it's an EV. Charging takes time. It's not like a five minute top up and you keep going. So part of the scheduling is also the charging. So a, a driver could have 30% and then we'll tell him, keep going, buddy. And someone will have 70% and we'll say, you know what, go and top up now because yeah. we're going to drain you for the rest of the day. So there's the scheduling layer, the EV layer, and then there's the most challenging one, the charging layer because we're 100% solar complemented by battery. Okay. So that means your charging capacity during the day is different from the night, but there's a lot of activities going on through the day. And if you plug all your charges at night, at the end of the day, the lights are gonna go out. I think close to 20 different metrics above and below the water, temperature, wind, air quality, everything related to marine life, birds, you name it. All of this is measured and aggregated, and we have a large team of data scientists and environmental scientists who assess, analyze, optimize based on that. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps going. You can go a long way in achieving a lot of things we're achieving with very simple tweaks or investments, like eliminating single-use plastics. That's something almost every hotel can do, every destination can do producing, minimizing, if not eliminating the use of paper. And it's actually economically better, not just environmentally, when you do the math. Using solar, it's becoming very, very economic. 
and it doesn't have to be 100% solar, but complementing whatever, whatever you have is going to be better for your wallet and also better for the environment. So there are a lot of things that can be taken today, right now, from what we're doing and implemented as we go on this journey. We understand the complexities of integrating sustainability into tech. With the global push towards net zero emissions, every industry's contribution counts. We now turn our attention to the mining industry, where sustainability efforts are not just beneficial, but critical for its future viability. Traditionally, the mining industry has been um, labor-intense business, um, working on efficiency to improve corporate profits and focusing maybe less on uh, environmental and issues and sustainability issues. As the um, demand for uh, minerals is going up and the regulatory pressures increasing, the sustainability environmental issues are becoming more uh, important for mining companies to comply with. So in the mining operations, uh, you have the, the uh, mining part and then you have the processing part and both these activities uh, are going in, in a way of becoming more sustainable. But it has to do with use of energy and energy sources in the right way, it use of other resources like uh, water, uh, land, chemicals, use of technology in, for instance, uh, water treatment, uh, waste management, and all other aspects are, are, are becoming uh, more and more sustainable in that way. From space, our planet's environmental challenges are not just visible, they are addressable. The CGI Seeds program, in collaboration with the United Nations, leverages satellite technology to pinpoint and tackle pollution with astounding accuracy. This initiative embodies the powerful synergy of global cooperation in high-tech solutions in safeguarding our planet's water resources. CGI Seeds program is a program that we launched in 2022 with the United Nations. SEED stands for Sustainability Exploration and Environmental Data Science. We recently progressed a research um, in water pollution to identify pollution using earth observation and satellite data. This is effectively where we've applied satellite data, sensors, as well as artificial intelligence to predict where pollution would occur within our river systems, our oceans and our lakes. And we've been able to detect and identify pollution with a 95% accuracy. Of course, we have another project which is looking to identify groundwater in areas that are desert stricken and are prone to heat. There are several communities out there that um, are, are worried about the state of their rivers but even having the basic necessity as not being sure as whether you will have water in a year or five years is worrying to say the least. We do need to achieve that 1.5 degree pathway by 2050 because science is showing us through the IPCC that there would be catastrophic activities that would happen to our planet and our Earth post-2050. For example, increased floods that would ultimately impact communities, forcing them to migrate and move to different parts. Um, so we are starting to see a very big move to connect and link aspects of sustainability with the wider economic factors and other factors within um, nations and within the world. With over 60% of waste being recycled in progressive communities around the world, the potential for growth and improvement is immense. Finally, as we wrap up our episode, we reflect on the cumulative insights shared, looking forward to the actions and innovations that will reshape our sustainable future. In India's coastal communities, 420 million 
people face waste management issues, out of which 48% are women. Beiru and Transform see this as a massive opportunity to not only bolster circular economies locally, but also create livelihood opportunities and socio-economic independence. Uh, with Transform support, uh, we've set up processes and kick-started so many community operations that now women are moving from something as simple as sleeping on the floor to sleeping on the mattress. Women are actually buying bikes for transport as opposed to relying on others for their modes of transport. Some of them have been able to put their daughters through uh, college who are now working as even professors. We've managed to so far generate about 1,000 livelihoods for women and also impact about 1,500 boatmen. And we're actually very proud of that because it's not just income. It's how we've qualitatively changed lives. When you look at the qualitative side of things, it's how these lives have improved with their families. The 4,000 people that are indirectly impacted because of these uh, livelihoods and also the community at large. One of the key things that we looked at is how does the community look at waste? And the fact that we've been able to combine efforts of different departments and sections of communities has led to this uh, success for us. We explored the intricate details behind sustainable tourism, the redefinition of transportation, and the rise of service-based economies that are both regenerative and supportive of local talent. From satellites monitoring global emissions to grassroots initiatives empowering communities, this episode has shown us the profound impact of our collective efforts to create a sustainable world. Being sustainable today is not good enough because we have already degraded the planet. So we just we don't want to uh, sustain a degraded state of the planet. Hence the commitment to enhance and to be net positive. So that would be the first ambition that has to be defined for any company. And after that, it's really about embracing innovation and thinking outside the box and not shying away from being off grid. We can produce, we can create our own grid, whether we are referring to water, to energy, even food. There is a lot of food that we can produce and source locally. So it is about setting the bar high. It is about collaboration. None of this can be achieved in a silo. We have to monitor what we do. If we cannot measure, we cannot manage. That's the saying, which is so true when it comes to sustainability. So it is important for any corporate to invest resources, to commit to monitoring its performance and to be transparent about it. This is not about only showing the good. If we have pain points, it is good to share those pain points and to find ways to solve them. And so commitment to data and data sharing, reporting, and ultimately disclosure is very important to achieving the goal. We have agency, we have power with every single decision that we make, even our consumption decisions that we make, our voting decisions, our savings decisions, our investment decisions. We have agency and we have power through our choices. And if every single one of us understands that power, and if every single one of us is not only aware of the environmental and social challenges that we're facing, but in fact, if every single one of us sees this as our problem, it is about our lifetime. These impacts are already here with us. It's about not only improving our lives, but essentially sustaining a thriving society within a thriving planet for us and for future generations. As we move forward, remember that every choice matters, from the energy we consume to the products we buy. Our global challenges demand global solutions and together we can create a sustainable world for generations to come. Let's take these lessons to heart, turn insight into action and build a future that works for both people and the planet. Thank you for joining us on this journey and let's continue to innovate and inspire. <laughs>